Welcome back to Tom's World Scale Model Series. In this episode, we tackle the building of our ICM 135th Scale Standard B Liberty Truck. If you enjoy programming on scale modeling, then show your support by subscribing to this channel. Leave us a comment, like, dislike, or share the video with friends. Clicking the notification bell gives you alerts when we post new content. Or visit the channel Tom's World for a friendly visit for a complete list of all our videos. Our unboxing of the ICM Liberty truck found a nicely cast and beautifully detailed kit. The large format color instruction booklet was laid out neatly. Parts to build either an uncovered, ribbed or full canvas covered bed were right in the box. Like the real Liberty truck, this kit on first blush appeared fairly simple. The kit contains no photo etch, just three clear parts and overall the assemblies appear to be straightforward. So stick with us as we take a journey through time to build a vehicle that marked the birth of American industrialized military truck design. Although we primarily build World War II subject matter on the series, now and again we do delve into other periods. Our Mang FT-17 was a fascinating and educational project. It was interesting to see how these early tanks were designed and put together, and how engineers overcame the material and manufacturing challenges. As a result, I was eager to get building the Liberty truck. It's no-nonsense, almost primitive lines, along with its oil lamps, canvas-covered stagecoach cab, and solid rubber wheels. The build is already taking on a vintage flavor. Our build-up starts with the frame, radiator, and leaf springs. And here are the parts cleaned up, ready for assembly. The kit has many small parts and we get a few to deal with early in the build. Some of the assemblies with these tiny parts seem over-engineered and one wonders why ICM simply didn't mold parts like this on. The model's frame is built up with separate pieces, two long ones and several shorter cross members. Some truck kits like this Tamiya Opal Blitz come with the frame already assembled. This takes the guesswork out of getting everything aligned and square. Here's our Liberty truck frame with some of the cross members glued in. The assembly isn't hard, we just have to check that the cross pieces are perpendicular to the long pieces. The part fit is very good. This cross member gets installed after the frame is glued up and it slips into its slots perfectly. The radiator is beautifully detailed and the two halves go together effortlessly. However, the halves are poorly sculpted and we're left with a nasty seam. In this photograph of a Liberty restoration, we can see that the rad top appears to be a one-piece stamping with a smooth top. In addition to the noticeable center seam, the two halves create a V-shaped trough which is quite deep and therefore hard to fill. We'll do some light filling, but a fair amount of work would be required to replicate the smooth top as in the real article. Step 14 has us install the front axle beam. The beam is the first example of an issue that plagues a few parts in this kit. Here's the actual part. It's almost perfectly symmetrical but it has these little plug holes on one of its sides where the stabilizer bar gets installed. These holes must be aligned so they face the rear of the vehicle. We see in step 20 that the stab bar gets installed on the back side of the axle beam. However, the axle beam and frame lack good alignment aids. And if we don't pay careful attention to the instructions, it's easy to install the axle beam backwards. This is the correct installment of the axle beam and stab bar. It's the same story with the two-part differential. The parts lack asymmetrical witness marks and we can see that the two parts can be assembled correctly and incorrectly. This is the correct way the part should be assembled. We see the little mounting pit for the grease nipple sits opposite to the drive shaft mounting. If we compare the differential parts in this Tamiya steer kit, we see the pins and holes are offset. This type of kit engineering makes assembling the parts backwards impossible. Back to our Liberty truck, another problem is that the pegs and mounting holes for the wheel mounting disc are again symmetrical. It is therefore possible to mount the rim upside down if we're not paying attention. This is the correct way to mount the rims. 
we have to make sure these little round depressions are on the same side as these square witness marks. This orientation is important since these support arms get installed into the witness marks later. Another issue is the loose fit of the rim to the differential. Here we're dry fitting the rear wheel, hub and differential and we can see just how loose the fit is. Rather than following the instructions, we'll paint everything first, then we'll attach the hub to the wheels, then we'll glue the hub and wheel assembly to the differential. That way we'll ensure the wheels aren't crooked once we glue them in place. Despite the issues with the differential and hubs, the detail on the inside of the hubs is very nice. Step 23 has us install what appears to be the steering linkage. The instructions are a little unclear as to how this part gets attached, and there doesn't seem to be an obvious attachment point on the steering knuckle. I wasn't able to find a clear photo showing this detail, but this one kind of gets us in the ballpark. And here's my best guess as to where this rod gets attached. ICM would do well to clarify the instructions since guessing at parts placement when building is a bit frustrating. These two little springs which build up with two parts are a screaming example of over engineering. And the sprue gate is in a really bad spot right on the helical pattern which makes cleanup a real pain. Not sure why ICM didn't cast these as a single piece. Steps 24, 25 and 31 and 32 have us install the front fenders. The fenders look good, but the holes for the supports are oversized. This leaves rather unsightly depressions on the inside of the fenders. These depressions will need filling since they're obvious on the finished model. Next we build up our wheels and here are the parts cleaned up and ready for assembly. The wheels come in two parts and avoid having to fill any potential seam on the rubber rings. We apply more glue than usual. We then clamp the two halves together tightly. This causes a bead of melted plastic to ooze out of the seam and this is exactly what we're looking for. Once the glue dries completely in about two hours, we can sand the bead down. The bead acts as a filler and we can see that we're left with no visible seam after sanding. A little more drama crops up in steps 37 and 38. Ostensibly, we're provided with the option of using two different wheel hubs, part 64 or 51. Only problem is we only get one part 51. We can see the lonely little piece here on the sprue map and on the sprue. Not a deal breaker, but just another odd little oversight. On to my favorite part of truck modeling, the engine. And here are some of the parts ready for assembly. Again, due to the lack of clear witness marks, it's easy to install the cylinder heads incorrectly. The heads fit snugly irrespective of which cylinder we place them on. The issue is these two little holes, which have to mate up with a part that gets installed later. This installation is incorrect since the holes are too far apart. And this is the correct installation, where the holes are closer together. Now the little rod that gets installed on the heads fits snugly. Again, when building this kit, we really have to pay attention to the instructions. Step 41 directs us to install the fan belt cog incorrectly. This is the correct installation. To our relief, the parts only fit if installed correctly. That aside, once built up, the engine looks great and it falls nicely into the frame. We could super detail the engine with wires and such, but we'll build out of the box to get a sense of the kit on its own merits. Next up is the cab. We encounter no problems here. There are two knockout scars on the inside surface of the firewall that we'll clean up, but they're shallow and easy to get at. We can plane down the indentations with our number 16 blade. We then finish with a few swipes of our sanding sticks. And here's the cleaned up firewall. These other scars get covered by parts that are installed over them so they can stay. And here's the mostly assembled cab. We'll leave the seats out for now so we can paint them separately. But even without the seats, the cab is very nicely detailed and looks great. There are also very shallow knockouts on the front of the rad protector grill. This surface is very visible on the finished model. Like the firewall scars, these are also very shallow, so a light sanding is all that's needed. The following steps have us build up the cargo bed and stowage bins. The bins come as five separate pieces each, as does the gas tank. But the fit here is very good and the bins and gas tank fall together with a minimum of effort.
Thankfully there are no knockouts on any of the bed pieces, but they do lack wood graining texture. We'll leave the bed unassembled for now. I haven't decided whether I'll depict painted wood or whether I'll try scraping or painting on a wood texture. Leaving the bed pieces unassembled will make painting the panels much easier. We have the option to depict our truck with or without the canvas covers on the cab and bed, or with just the support ribs on the bed. Here are the pieces that make up the cab cover. The oblong holes are where the clear side windows get installed. We'll install those after painting. There are three shallow knockout scars in the inside of the cab canopy. They're hard to see so I'll likely leave these alone. But for contest buildings these should definitely get filed or scraped away. Likewise on the cab canopy sides there are three more knockouts. We can clean these up easily with a little scraping and sanding. And here are the pieces that build up the bed cover. There are also eight knockout scars on the inside of the canvas top. These are hard to see on the finished model so we'll leave these alone. But for contest building they should be filled. Once built up the canvas bed looks good and the parts in general fit nicely together. The parts are a little tricky to clamp for gluing and we're left with a few visible seams. If we decide to mount the canvas top we'll definitely have to fill and tidy up these gaps. We get the option of depicting our cargo bed with just the canvas supports and five of them come in the box. They're very fragile and each are attached with eight sprue gates. We have to be very careful when removing them from the sprue tree since they break quite easily. The ribs also have a mold parting burr along the inside and outside edges so cleaning up these ribs does require patience and care so we don't break them. And one final bit of confusion, step 67 has us install these tail lamps. And here are the actual lamp pieces. Note their tiny size. Even on closer inspection, the instructions aren't crystal clear as to where these lamps attach to. And there's no obvious witness marks or other hints on the frame to suggest where these tail lamps get installed. The color guide doesn't provide any clues either as to where these lamps go. Indeed, these lamps are totally absent in these illustrations. There's also a color illustration on the box. Again, no lights. I did finally manage to find this CAD rendering of the finished model. The location of the mysterious lamps is finally revealed. Clearer instructions or obvious mounting marks on the parts would have relieved us of having to hunt around for this part location. The hood pieces are nicely molded, complete with louvers, but they're each a single piece. Given how beautiful the engine is, it would be a real shame to cover it up. We'll look at modifying one of the hood leaves to expose the engine. We'll do that in part 2, our painting and weathering episode. And we can't forget to set aside these near microscopic hood clamps, which get installed once everything is painted. So with most of our major sub-assemblies complete and the rest of our parts cleaned up, we're ready to start our painting and weathering. Although some builders like to fully complete their models before painting, I prefer leaving some parts loose to ease airbrushing and weathering. This gives me greater control and I don't have to contort my hand to paint hard to reach places. This also reduces the chance of leaving bare spots which we may miss with our airbrush. And that'll do it for this episode. Check back soon for the painting and weathering finale of our ICM Liberty Truck Project. If you enjoy Model Kit unboxings, builds and painting and weathering videos, why not subscribe to the channel? Or leave us a like, dislike, share the video or sound off in the comments. Otherwise drop by the channel Tom's World for a neighborly visit and for a complete list of all our entertaining and educational videos. In the meantime, keep your model manufacturing lines open, stay well and all the best.